You know, I, I don't miss work a bit. <laughs> Y'all, this is Todd Foolery, and how come when people talk unforgettable moms of the 90s and people meaning this random Screen Rant article I found from 2017, it's always Janet Darling from Clarissa or Jill Taylor from Home Improvement or even Amy Matthews from Boy Meets World, no shade, but why is no one talking about Barbara Mack? Not only does she have a career and work full time, but Barbara is also a supportive partner, an incredibly understanding yet stern mother, and between all that, still finds time to put dinner on the table table every night. Hashtag give Barbara Mack the credit she deserves. If you haven't watched my Alex Mack season one retrospective, I suggest you do so here, because in this video, we're going to be talking about season two, changes they made, things that worked, some things that didn't, and then discussing the accompanying book series that was released the same year as this season premiered. Now let's slowly increase the music for the title screen. Before we get started, thank you so much for watching. I post new videos when I release them, so if you enjoy revisiting television of decades past, make sure you share this video, like, tap that subscribe button, then hit the little notification bell to see more videos like this one. As always, if you have any specific shows you want me to revisit, drop them down in the comment section and I'll add them to my list. Now, I always like to set the vibe before I dive into my retrospective, so here we go. The network is Nickelodeon. The year is 1995. While Rugrats was on temporary hiatus, airing only two new episodes this year, Are You Afraid of the Dark was premiering with its fifth season. Nickelodeon Guts, renamed Global Guts at this point, was entering its fourth and final season. Rocco's Modern Life and the Adventures of Pete and Pete were in their third, while all that, along with ah, real monsters, were returning for their second. Also this year, Little Bear, which will get its own retrospective eventually, made its debut on Nickelodeon. Jr. while Ren and Stimpy aired its series finale after five seasons, Legends of the Hidden Temple came to an end after three, and My Brother and Me ended after only a single season. We'll be revisiting that one very soon as well. As you can see, when the second season of The Secret World of Alex Mack premiered on October 14th, there was nothing else like it on Nickelodeon. In fact, with My Brother and Me airing its finale January of that year, the only other live action narratives were Are You Afraid of the Dark, Pete and Pete, and all that. Now you've really got to respect the diversity of that lineup. Nickelodeon really strived to have something for every kid. And fun fact, before we talk changes between seasons one and two, the second season of Alex Mack premiered the same month Nick.com was launched on AOL's Kids Only channel. Let that one sink in. Presidential hopeful Raymond Alvarado cried at the Lion King. I did not. Yes, you did. Okay, listen, I've accepted that a full 60 second theme song is a ridiculous use of time for adult television. I get it. But as a child, nothing was better than a show returning with updated clips in the opening. It was seriously my preview of the new season. I ain't need no trailer, no promotional materials. Just show me that sweet brand new opening and I'd be as happy as a billy goat on Tuesday. Still felt the same with season two of Alex Mack. In the opening alone, we get a preview of the updated special effects with Alex's morphing becoming more of that Mercury-like Terminator substance instead of the see-through watery look, and even Alex's voiceover is redone, taking on a bit more of a serious tone and becoming less playful, perhaps hinting at less preteen and more teen situations as Alex is an eighth grader now, people. She's got more complex issues like house parties and sneaking out after being grounded. Along with the updated opener came seven additional episodes increasing the episode count to 20, with the finale airing September 28th, 1996, and then a slew of brand new characters, some being great additions, while others, you know, unbearable. <laughs> so first, Kelly is introduced in episode one, replacing Jessica as Alex's junior high antagonist, but is set up so much better. So there's more to dislike than just the fact that she becomes Scott's girlfriend, which I have no idea how he's just so oblivious to Alex's crush on him, but I digress. One of my favorite episodes involves Kelly spreading rumors about Alex being a thief and then lying when she's confronted about it and proven wrong. She also just goes out of her way to be manipulative. So yeah, I hate her too. 
And then there's Bryce, who's a library employee introduced in episode two as a love interest for Annie, and he's actually a really sweet guy. I think it was great to explore Annie being in a relationship, giving her more than just science stuff, but also interesting to see how she begins to balance both in compromise because Bryce really isn't a science person like she is. There's also Miss Clark, who's Alex's history teacher as well as the track coach, and while she doesn't become a season regular per se, she does appear in three to four episodes and is probably probably my favorite addition to the cast. It'd be easy for a show like this to vilify a teacher, but instead, she inspires Alex to join the track team, makes history fun, and is more of a support system than anything. Finally, we get Lewis introduced in episode three when his family moves in next door to Alex, and I swear, I got triggered. If you know how the series ends, you know why, and I'll just leave that there. Aside from that, though, he's just so unlikable, even when they try to redeem him. He's obnoxious, selfish, irresponsible, turns on his friends on a dime, then begs for forgiveness, but only when he needs something in return. He's like that kid you hated, but your best friend was friends with them, so you had to tolerate them. He's like 100% that kid, so I guess it's fine to give Ray a male friend to bro out with. Plus, making him unlikable is obviously intentional, so it displays more about Alex's character than anything because there are countless times she could have just left him out to dry, but doesn't. So, Lewis Driscoll, everybody. I really did enjoy how the show turned it up a notch for its sophomore season though, not just with additional characters, but amplifying everything I liked from season one. Scott, look what I made. Uh, maybe your little friends would like to see it too. Oh no! In my first video, I mentioned forgetting how funny the show was. Well, season two is even funnier, but what's more impressive is how they increase the already pretty high stakes, add more creative style and flair, then maintain the show's emotional core. Right off the bat, the show reveals investors putting pressure on Daniel Atron, wanting more progress on the GC161 research, increasing the sense of urgency, and resulting in more extreme steps being taken to find Alex. Not only does this lead to more chemistry and comedic moments between Dave and Vince, making them behave like an old married couple. Do you still hate me? Yes. It also adds an interesting dynamic within the Mac family after George is promoted to the head of GC161 research with the most hilarious celebratory scene possible. A promotion? Well, I don't get a new title. Does it mean a raise? She didn't mention it. Does it mean longer hours? Much longer. More pressure? Robin, of course, is still my favorite and just as funny as ever, and because this is the second season, the show's really settling into each character and amplifying those already established personality traits. There's this scene where Robin is paired with Alex's overly optimistic grandmother, and I swear, I couldn't stop laughing. The hot, toxic, lethal sun pouring through the hole in the ozone, slowly killing us. It is so extra, but it's also just so Robin. While episode 11 was my overall favorite, episode 12 by far was the funniest for me. Alex helps Ray run for class president, and while that produces comedy all on its own with a nice message actually, the B story follows Barbara taking a day off in the form of going overboard as a housewife, and I was not expecting it to be that funny. Danielle and Barbara also work together again, and the awkward comedic chemistry between the two actresses is just phenomenal. The comedy just plays so well within the boundaries of realism and fantasy. Aside from that, additional episodes mean exploring deeper themes and more character development. This season we get Halloween and Christmas themed episodes. The Halloween one being shot with a darker tone and using a modified frame rate making some of the movement choppy to add more spooky creepiness but also having a lot of heart. Then the Christmas episode being shot with warmer more welcoming tones and a message that doesn't revolve around buying presents for loved ones, but showing how acts of service express love too. And I absolutely love that. We also get what if episodes, where in one Ray has a dream he gets Alex's powers through a lightning strike, but uses them to become famous, don't ask. And another where Alex wishes she'd never been born. So it creates this alternate reality where Annie isn't smart, Ray is Vince's puppet, George is just a loading guy at the chemical plant, and Barbara is the one doused in GC-161. And those were fun. In terms of character development, one thing I 
absolutely adore about this season is how it doesn't just center around Alex. While Annie gets her own major storyline, so do George and Barbara. In fact, there were a lot of scenes where we just follow the parents discussing simple things like parenting or personal hobbies. There's even an episode where the B story is them going on a couple's vacation and that was a hilarious story arc. In addition, Ray gets a couple episodes, episode 6 revolves around Nicole, episode 18, Lewis, and episode 20 is Robin-centric. I was not expecting this, but it's nice to get time to develop the supporting cast because I now feel genuinely connected to all of them. Even Lewis! Of course though, with more episodes, not all of them are gonna be hits. And with that, we've got to talk about some of the things that didn't work so well for me. Wait a minute. <laughs> How can he hang out with the guy who got you in trouble? Oh, haven't you heard Raymond and Lewis are very close now? Well, I think this is an incredibly well-crafted 90s kids show. It's still a 90s kids show. So there are definitely a lot of filler episodes where things just felt rather anticlimactic, the story has an abrupt ending, or it just feels like nothing really gets resolved by the end of the episode. And for me, this season has somewhat of a slow start and a pretty slow finish. Things don't really start getting interesting until the fourth episode in my opinion, but then again, Louis Driscoll might have put a bad taste in my mouth because he's introduced in episode 3. But then episodes 14 to 18 seem to be rather forgettable. I think it's safe to say these episodes provide great standalone scenes as episode 15 was that pessimistic Robin versus optimistic grandma one I mentioned and 16 is the one where George and Barbara go on vacation but as a whole a lot of them leave a lot to be desired. There also isn't a lot of Ray's dad this season and I really enjoyed that from season 1. They had a lot of heartfelt moments and I liked their interactions but I think he only appears in Ray's what if episode this season and that was kind of disappointing. Lastly, I don't even know if this is a negative thing or not, but the daydreams were definitely not as present as they were in season one. Not to say it drastically reduced the quality of the show, and I'm not even sure if I missed them, but it was a noticeable difference that I just chopped up to Alex getting older, I guess. That said, if an episode wasn't great this season, it's only a bit of the storytelling that falls flat for me. Each episode still had a lot of hard or great comedic moments continuing to surprise me with how much funnier it is than I remember. Now let's talk about these books that accompany the show because I think that's actually pretty interesting. A fellow gets so jealous of Desdemona he goes nuts. That's not very realistic. Yes it is. Jealousy is like a, a disease. It can suck at your soul until all you can think about is sweet, sweet revenge. Now, I can do a whole video on this because I find it so fascinating, but while Nickelodeon turned the Animorphs book series into a live action show in 1999, I had no idea they kinda had a thing doing the opposite by turning a lot of their shows into books. Like, quite a few, actually. And it looks like that began in 95, a year before the Animorphs books even started getting published. I was able to find Nickelodeon YA books for Are You Afraid of the Dark, Clarissa Explains It All, The Journey of Alan Strange, The Mystery Files of Shelby Wu, and even Kenan and Kel's Good Burger. One and a part two. So I sincerely apologize for saying the Alan Strange books were published to mimic the success of Animorphs. Looks like I was wrong and it was actually just Nickelodeon doing what they've always done. And honestly, it's genius. Why not have your content repurposed for multiple platforms, especially with the website launching in 95 as well. Now, some of these books were literal adaptations of specific episodes, while some merely took inspiration from the source material and others told completely original stories that tied into the show's actual narrative. This is where the secret world of Alex Mack comes in. Between 1995 and 1998, 34 books featuring Alex and the rest of the Paradise Valley crew were published alongside the show. They typically range from 130 to 180 pages and targeted 8 to 12 year olds being young adults. Now 10 of these 34 books were written by Diana G. Gallagher and this appeared to launch her career as an author who specialized in books based on TV because she went on to write books based on other shows like Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and Charmed. 
I guess she's got a type. <laughs> Here's where it gets really interesting though. Only the first and last Alex Mack books were direct adaptations of the first and final episodes. The rest being completely original storylines that tied directly into the main narrative through references of various plot lines from the actual show. What's great about this is that it truly expands the Alex Mack world. So while we got a total of 78 episodes from the series run, there are an additional 32 stories that take place in the same world in the form of these books. And I'm talking Alex getting lost in Vegas, Alex Ray and Lewis working on a movie set, and even Alex going to visit Robin in New York. Some of these books are wild, y'all, but that's what I find so cool. It gave the show an opportunity to have fun and tell stories that may have been out of Nickelodeon's budget. Even Ken Lipman, the show's co-creator, is credited for writing one of these books. And again, because they actually reference events from the show, it keeps it all coherent. That's awesome. So yeah, had no clue the books were even a thing, but super interesting. If you want to check them out, I have an Amazon link to them in the description box. Hope you enjoyed revisiting season two of Alex Mack and learning about the book series with me. This season definitely proved to be funnier than I remember. And real quick, I also want to give credit to the production team because I was really impressed with how creative the practical effects were, even more so than the first season. There were countless times that they didn't resort to CGI and I appreciated that. As we approach season three though, we finally get to talk about one of my all time favorite episodes, i.e. that one time Alex gets split into a bad and good version of herself in the other side parts one and two. We'll also discuss some of the fashion which really started to take shape in this season, but I feel becomes a little bit more prominent in season three. And honestly, everything between Alex becoming two people in the series finale, I completely forgot. So this will all be brand new to me. And regardless, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. Let me know what you thought about this video down in the comment section below. And while you're down there, let me know your favorite episodes of the season, if you remember. Like I said, I absolutely adored episode 11, but episodes 5 and 9 were also really great, too. Super special thank you to these supporters here. And if you'd like to support me, the channel, and all future projects, you can find me on these apps here, where donating will never be necessary, but is tremendously appreciated. Next video, we'll be revisiting my brother and me and the brothers Garcia since there's a reboot coming soon, then season three of Alex Mack and Taina shortly after that. Hopefully I'll find some time to start my Disney retrospective series with Jet Jackson and So Weird queued up, so keep an eye out for that as well. In the meantime, feel free to stick around, you know, click some buttons, and then go ahead and check out the rest of my videos here. <laughs> Don't forget to follow me on social, then hit that thumbs up, it really helps me out, then subscribe with a side of notification bell. Until next time, shine on, you crazy diamonds.